Good morning and thank you for joining us for the latest talk in the Australian War Memorial's History Webinar Series. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting on today. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. My name is Megan Adams and I'm a historian in the military history section here at the Australian War Memorial. This morning we will be hearing from Craig Tibbetts, who will be speaking to us about German paratrooper operations on Crete during the Second World War. Craig has worked at the memorial since 2000, initially in the Research Centre where he became Senior Curator of Official and Private Records. In 2016, he joined the Military History Section as a Research Project Manager for an independent history of Vietnam War's medical legacies before securing a permanent position as a Senior Historian. Craig has studied Information Management, Libraries, Records and Archives at the University of Canberra and is currently completing a postgraduate degree in Military History at the University of New South Wales, ADFA. I'll pass over to you now, Craig. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Meg. This presentation is based on an article about the German paratroopers on Crete that I had published in the Memorials magazine Wartime earlier this year. Um, while I'll cover much of what was in that article, uh, I'll also expand on a few areas and include some material and images that I didn't have space to include in the magazine. In May 1941, Australians were involved in an important battle for the possession of Crete. The island controlled the eastern Mediterranean and could play an important role offensively or de defensively for both sides. Alongside comrades from Great Britain, New Zealand and Greece, the Australians would face the might of the German war machine, led by their elite force of paratroopers, Fallschirmjäger. While the 10-day battle would end in defeat for the Allies, the German victory hung by a thread during the first 48 hours. The story of the much vaunted Fallschirmjäger could easily have ended there and then. The development of airborne forces came in the aftermath of the First World War. Seeking to avoid the stalemate of trench warfare, the idea of dropping troops behind enemy lines in concert with a conventional breakthrough battle now with mobile armoured forces and direct air support, had much appeal. During the 1920s and 1930s, most major powers experimented with airborne troops, both glider-borne or parachute. As with tanks and close support aircraft, it was Nazi Germany that had such a force ready to go by 1939. Combined, these forces would spearhead Germany's Bewegungskrieg, a war of movement, often simply referred to as Blitzkrieg. Germany's Fallschirmjäger belonged to the Luftwaffe, or Air Force. Formed in 1935, they started organising and training, honing their techniques and tactics. With their ranks filled by volunteers, in 1938 they expanded to form 7th Flieger Division. These highly trained and motivated troops were ready for war. In 1940, the Fallschirmjäger spearheaded Nazi Germany's invasions of Norway, Holland, France, and had some stunning early successes. On the back of these victories, the Paras were touted as the elite of the German Wehrmacht. Their leader, General Lieutenant Kurt Student Starr, was rising. Now he was looking for new operations that would let his men shine. An unexpected diversion to secure the Balkans would provide such an opportunity. As the Germans promptly booted an ill-equipped and undermanned Allied force out of Greece in April 1941, the Fallschirmjäger's most ambitious and daring operation became apparent. To complete the conquest of the Balkans in Greece, the island of Crete, only about 200 kilometres south of the mainland, would be seized. Operation Mercury an almost exclusively airborne conquest of the island, got Hitler's go-ahead. Capturing Crete was a logical and rather obvious step to conclude the conquest of the Balkans and secure Germany's southern front ahead of their invasion of Russia, which was planned for June that year. Possession of Crete would uh, deprive the Allies of a naval base and airfields in the eastern Mediterranean, which could be used to bomb the Romanian airfields vital to Hitler's war machine. In Axis hands, the island would be a naval and air base to dominate the surrounding sea, 
bringing Suez and Alexandria and Egypt into bombing range. But there would not be much time to prepare. If Crete was to be taken, it was imperative to do it quickly. The aircraft would be needed for the invasion of the USSR. Crete would not be allowed to delay that much larger operation. In little more than four weeks, the operation would need to have been completed. Planning was hasty and much, of the, uh, and much was overlooked as the troops, aircraft and supplies were rushed to southern Greece. The plan involved parachute and glider troops going in first. Too few transport airport aircraft were available, so there would be two waves, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. They were organised into three separate groups, west, centre and east, targeting the main towns and airfields on Crete's northern coast, Malami, Hania, Suda, Retamo and Heraklion. Their main objective would be to secure at least one of the airfields. That done, troops of the 5th Mountain Division would be flown in and land to reinforce the Paris. Further reinforcements, including tanks, would be brought in by sea. Thus, the capture of Crete would be quickly completed. Air support for the ground attack would be overwhelming. 8th Fliegerkorps Corps would pummel Allied defences with 300 medium bombers, 150 Stuka dive bombers and around 200 fighter aircraft. They would have the skies almost practically to themselves. Allied air forces on Crete were almost non-existent. Just putting up a slide here outlining the order of battle for the um, German forces for Operation Mercury, uh, the capture of Crete. Total German strength to be landed on Crete was 10,000 Fallschirmjäger, the paratroopers, and 12,000 mountain troops known as Gebirgsjäger. But until the Paris secured an airfield to allow their comrades to be flown in, they would be on their own. Confident of facing only remnants of Allied troops evacuated from Greece, during this critical period the Germans would actually face odds of four to one. It would prove fateful. Just a couple of slides here showing some of the senior German commanders of the parachute forces. Most of these fellows survived the battle and survived the war. Rushed planning, overconfidence and exceptionally poor intelligence undermined the operation. In fact, General Feldmarschall Albert Kesselring later said that Crete is a classic example of how this should not be done claiming that such improvisation with such haste made for unacceptably high risks. He was also critical of the plan to drop Paris in several separate areas which were too far apart and diluted their strength. Kesselring was not involved in the planning for Crete and was speaking with the benefit of hindsight, but he was not wrong. Another experienced paratrooper, Rudolf Witzig, agreed that the scheme at the operational level, both in planning and execution, was weak. Quote, Everyone thought the Fallschirmjäger could do everything. They would be able to master this, master this as well, he later recalled. Intelligence about what they would face was very poor. At a briefing, Hauptmann Friedrich von der Heiter, commanding 1st Battalion, 3rd Fallschirmjäger Regiment, was informed that they were only remnants of two or three Greek divisions, much weakened, and a British force of only divisional strength, only around 15,000 men. He was also told that the population would be sympathetic towards the Germans. Aerial reconnaissance failed to identify the much larger Allied force on the island, or many of their positions. The Allies had done well in concealing troops and heavy weapons and had largely conducted movements at night. Adolf Strauch and Karl Pickert also recall being told that they would only be facing disorganised and demoralised collection of Allied troops on the island and that the mission would be easy. Overconfidence prevailed. Critically, for two reasons, there would also be no element of surprise. One of the critical keys to the employment of airborne troops Apart from being able to clearly observe the build-up of troops and aircraft in southern mainland Greece, 
The Allies also had ultra, meaning intelligence derived from breaking of German and Italian encrypted signals. Weeks before the attack, the complete German order of battle, their landing areas and objectives, reinforcements and the date for the attack on Crete were known to the Allies. All this meant that when the paratroopers arrived, they immediately realised they were faced by a far larger and better armed force than they had been led to believe. The actual number of Allied troops on the ground was some 42,000, including 18,000 British, 7,700 New Zealanders, 6,500 Australians and about 10,000 Greek soldiers. While some had been thrown together into ad hoc groups and many did not have their usual heavier weapons and equipment, most were battle experienced infantry. While there was a core of veterans among the German paratroopers, by 1941 the arm had expanded to divisional size and many of the troops were newly recruited and very young, some just teenagers. They had joined the Fallschirmjäger after the initial successes in 1940. According to Hauptmann von der Heiter, many of his young Jäger were motivated by idealism, ambition or adventure, but had very little, if any, combat experience. This would be a factor when they found themselves scattered in isolated pockets against a determined enemy. Experienced junior leaders were in short supply and soon many would become casualties as they led their men forward. Responsibility for so many young lives weighed heavily on von der Heide's mind the night before the operation. Beer and cognac were issued and many drank freely that night, not knowing what would be in store for them. Those who drank too much would regret the additional dehydration the next day. This is just a slide I'm putting up now to show a bit more detail the appearance of the German paratroopers, uh, weapons, equipment, etc. Uh, just note the uniform, it's a, uh, uh, particularly the helmet, it's a cut down small rimmed helmet. Uh, also the jump smock which goes over the uniforms and uh, the knee pads as well to help protect obviously the knees, knees upon landing. Um, down the bottom that uh, rectangular white container with the red stripe, that's the weapons containers that were dropped because the paratroopers were not dropped with, their, um, with most of their weapons. They would have to find those containers on the ground um, and get their weapons from there. And also the parachute as well. And just note the head first diving posture when leaving the plane and the chutes were opened by a static line uh, which allowed them to be dropped from lower heights, uh, you know, 100 to 150 metres in height um, from the ground. And see also how the parachute shroud lines are all gathered at one point on the trooper's back. Pictured here is a section of paratroopers prior to boarding their JU-52 transport plane to Crete. Uh, most photos that I've seen indicate each plane only carried 8 to 10 paratroopers, although the capacity of the planes was supposedly greater than that. Um, for Crete, the men were also encumbered with quite bulky life vests and they also had to fit in a couple of those weapons containers um, as well. But that's about section size, 8 to 10 I believe. So early on the morning of 20th of May 1941, the first waves of nearly 500 JU-52 transport aircraft carrying paratroopers took off from the makeshift airfields in southern mainland Greece. Some were towing gliders filled with Fallschirmjäger. As the aircraft took off, huge clouds of dust filled the air, causing delays to the schedule. This and other logistical problems would plague the operation throughout the day. One paratrooper described it as a terrible, chaotic fiasco. One early mishap brought a major blow. Not long after takeoff, a supporting bomber flew too close to a glider containing the 7th Flieger Division's commander, General Lieutenant Wilhelm Sussmann. The turbulence caused the glider to dip and buck violently, breaking the tow cable. Then both wings tore off and the fuselage plummeted to the ground. All aboard were killed when it struck rocks on the island of Aegina. 
It was an ominous start and the first of many mishaps and horrors to come. Flying time was just around two hours. Some paras sat in silence, deep in their own thoughts. Others chatted noisily or sang while others slept. The paratroopers were heavily kitted up. Over their uniforms, belts and personal equipment they wore the jump smocks I showed earlier to avoid snags within the plane and also snags on the shroud lines of the chutes. Plus the life jackets I mentioned and um, this all produced a rather bulky, ungainly appearance. The cool air of the early morning made all this bearable, but not for long once they landed. The long rectangular containers accompanied the Paris in which most of their rifles, machine guns and other heavier weapons were stored. They would be dropped by parachute and the men would have to find them on the ground. Although some preferred to carry their MP40 submachine guns, most would initially have only a pistol, a knife and perhaps a couple of egg grenades to defend themselves. Of the nearly 500 transport planes that had taken off with the first wave, only a few suffered mishaps during takeoff or the approach. Oberfeldwebel Walter Wachter was the pilot of a DFS-230 glider. As they approached the island, he saw a transport plane suddenly pull ahead, trailing a tow rope but no glider. Something had gone wrong and just like that a section of paratroopers had been lost on the way. But the vast bulk of the force had arrived scattered but intact. Immediately over the Group West sector, Malame, and Group Centre, Prison Valley, Hania, Suda, heavy fire erupted. Kurt Seiler could see bullets zipping through his glider. They crashed to the ground and the pilot was killed. The paras stumbled out of the wreck but were soon sprayed with more bullets. Two more were hit before they could find cover. As Jaeger Carl Pickett and his comrades leapt from their aircraft, he immediately realised they were in for a bad time. Heinrich Pabst recalled, When we jumped, it was into the very great shock of multiple flak and infantry defensive fire, and many men, including some of my own, never reached the ground alive. There was a veritable storm of fire, with planes burning and crashing and the cries of men in pain as they dropped around me. The noise was infernal. At Heraklion, the slaughter of paratroops continued during the afternoon. Here, the Allied force was especially strong and well equipped. Their task of protecting the airfield was relatively easy. As German transport planes flew over the objective, a hail of anti-aircraft fire engulfed them. Australians, perched on two tall hills, could fire into the aircraft as they flew slowly past them. Some remember seeing a plane on fire, disgorging its parachutes, its paratroopers, excuse me, all of their chutes disintegrating at once, and the men plummeting to their deaths. Adolf Strauch remembered their planes flying in low and slow, 120 kilometres an hour. Allied fire tore into them. Many were on fire and crashed. He also recalled the terrible feeling of being fired on while descending by parachute, unable to shoot back. Some Germans felt it was unchivalrous for the defenders to fire upon them as they floated down by parachute. But war is war, and it involves killing, sometimes ruthlessly. Soldiers under attack do not wait for enemy troops to make it to the beach during a seaborne landing. Why should arriving on the battlefield by parachute be any different? Such is the lot of a paratrooper. Australians were present at all four of the main landing areas, Malame, Hania Suda, Retamo and Heraklion, and were quickly involved in the fighting. Lieutenant Wald Gudgeon of the 2nd 8th Battalion recalled the dreadful drone of the German aircraft coming towards them. He remembers hordes of enemy paratroopers descending, and though they suffered heavy casualties, more kept pouring in. As fast as they were landed, and some of them were being wiped out by the New Zealanders and Australians, and so on, others were taking their place, he said. Private Reg Saunders, who's pictured in the top left uh, photo, uh, a Gunditjmara man uh, from Western Victoria, with the 2nd 7th Battalion, later said, 
When they were dropping paratroopers on top of our ground troops, we were a little bit too good for them. We killed them in the bloody hundreds. Really shot them down. It's like shooting ducks. Bang, bang, bang. Private Al Alf Passfield was with the Australian 2nd 11th Battalion at Retamo. He felt it must have been more frightening for the paratroopers as they were showering them with bullets as they descended, some landing alive, some dead. Passfelt was wounded and after being treated at an aid post where German and Australian doctors worked side by side, he became a prisoner of war along with many of his comrades. Lieutenant Norman Whitlaw, an artillery officer fighting as an infantryman, said, the Germans were decimated. They were being shot down as they dangled under their parachutes. Planes and gliders were a mess on the ground. Planes were ploughing into wrecks and other planes while they tried to land. Those who escaped enemy fire could also fall victim to accidents. Several accounts mention paratroopers whose chutes snagged on the tails on the transport's tailplane, dragging them helplessly through the sky. The flimsy gliders were especially vulnerable subject either to violent movements or enemy fire. Again, there were several cases where the gliders fell apart, disintegrated, or with their wings shorn off, fell to the ground, killing everyone on board. Those that made it down often suffered severe damage as they skidded through hard ob obstacles which also tore the gliders apart with catastrophic results. Mist drops also accounted for the deaths of many paratroopers. Some were dropped in the wrong area, landing literally on the heads of large, well-armed units of Allied troops who shot them to pieces in the sky, or when they landed, before they could reach their weapons containers and adequately arm themselves. In many cases, inexperienced dispatchers who gave the order to jump produced catastrophe. Dozens of men landed in the reservoir and drowned. Others were dropped too close to the coast and drifted out to sea, suffering the same fate. Another complication for the Fallschirmjäger was that they were equipped with a badly designed parachute. This meant the individual had very little control of his body position or direction, drifting either forwards or backwards, and often landing almost on all fours instead of on both feet. Not only was this the main reason weapons had to be dropped separately, but it also resulted in many injuries upon landing. If they survived the descent and the landing, the paratroopers' day would only get worse from there. Some landed on top of strong allied positions and were wiped out in very short order. Others fought desperate individual battles, trying to survive until they could find a few comrades to link up with, or hid until dark. Heat and lack of water were also major problems with the paras during the first few days especially for the many wounded. As I mentioned before, Australians were present at all places where major fighting took place on Crete. Most were stationed in the Retamo sector, while others fought at Heraklion or between Hania and Suda Bay. There was, however, one tiny group of Australians who helped in the fight for the possession of the vital airfield at Malame. The 3rd Australian Light Anti-Aircraft Regiment was formed in Australia in August 1940. In early 1941, they were stationed near Gaza in Palestine and began training with their Bofors 40mm anti-aircraft guns. One of its batteries, the 7th, was destined for Greece, but with that campaign quickly unravelling, they were diverted to Crete in late April 1941. The battery was initially stationed near the main town of Hania. Some men helped out on the docks while others put up tents for a British Army hospital. At night they camped in the olive groves. Expecting the Germans would soon try and capture Crete, the 7th Battery's complement of 16 Bofors anti-aircraft guns would be valuable. At the end of April, headquarters along with the majority of B and C troops were moved east to Heraklion, where they would defend the aerodrome. On the 4th of May, A Troop was repositioned to defend Malame Airfield to the west of Hania. Before long, the Luftwaffe attacks commenced. The bombing, strafing 
gradually increased over the next few weeks until the morning of the 20th of May when all hell broke loose. Beginning just before 7am, each anti-aircraft gun was attacked by multiple dive bombers. Then came the gliders, followed by paratroops. Landing to the west of the Tavronitis River, the enemy glider troops immediately sought cover in the dry riverbed. Their mission was vital, to seize control of the bridge, then capture the adjacent Malame airfield. That would allow them to quickly bring in many more troops. The attackers were from the elite German Airborne Assault Regiment, the Luftlander Sturm Regiment. Their glider-borne troops had already suffered heavy casualties, but Major Braun and Oberleutnant von Plessen rallied a group of survivors for the assault. A fierce battle took place on the airfield's western end as they stormed the positions held by New Zealand infantrymen. The Germans were only a few yards away, hurling grenades into the main trench near the Bofors gun. The Australian anti-aircraft gunners joined their fellow Anzacs and fought it out, but they were soon overwhelmed. The position was taken and all but one were killed. The photo portraits on screen there are uh, uh, the seven men. Uh, they are those who died fighting with that anti-aircraft battery. Um, Sergeant Jeff Manning, Gunners Alexander Baird, Alan Goad, Harold Lyle, Ron Maskell, Daniel Ryan and Douglas Sinclair. An eighth Lance Bombardier Alfred Murphy is not pictured. By the end of the first day it seemed the airborne invasion had been defeated. At Heraklion and Retamo, the Falchemjäger were delayed for hours, arriving late in the afternoon piecemeal and with no air support. Here they met heavy opposition and were similarly cut to pieces. Allied forces kept a firm grip on the airfields and the situation for the Germans was grim. For many, it was all they could do to survive. In the West it looked the same, but here, after fighting so hard throughout the first day, the Allies would make a fateful mistake that night. Amid poor communication and a failure to grasp the importance of holding Malame airfield and Hill 107 which commanded it, the New Zealanders withdrew. In desperation, the German commander Student grabbed the opportunity putting in all his reserves and flying in mountain troops into land at Mal Malame airfield, despite the risk of further heavy losses. Through this chink in the defences, the battle turned. With one airfield they needed, the Germans could now bring in reinforcements necessary to clinch the battle. Ten days later, Crete was in German hands as the Allies suffered another humiliating defeat. I'll just show a few slides here now of German paratroops in action during the Battle of Crete. And just, uh, note the terrain, often quite open, broken country with hills and ravines, olive groves, stone walls. Some urban fighting took place as well, of course, in the um, villages and towns must uh, also remember it was very, very hot uh, during the battle, well, well above 30 degrees Celsius. Some of these photos were actually taken by the German correspondent and cameraman Franz Peter Weichsler, uh, showing Allied soldiers um, in action and also advancing after the battle had concluded, and some photos of Allied soldiers surrendering to the paratroopers when the gig was up. As I mentioned, the, once the Germans were able to fly in and land a couple of regiments of their mountain troops, some 12,000 men, plus heavier equipment, the balance quickly tipped in their favour and they were able to win the battle and force an Allied retreat and surrender.
Of the 42,000 Allied troops on Crete, about 19,000 were eventually evacuated by sea. That left a total of some 23,000 casualties, including about 1,700 killed, of whom 274 were Australian, with many others wounded and missing. The largest portion, around 21,000, were taken prisoner, 3,000 of them Australians. Despite their victory, German casualties had been very high, some 6,500 in total, Army and Air Force combined. Losses had been especially heavy among the Fallschirmjäger, the paratroopers. This elite arm suffered 3,162 killed in action and perhaps two to three hundred who later died of their wounds. That represented a full third of their force. Their bravery, amid such carnage, earned them 25 Knight's Crosses, a small consolation. There's an image here of an often told story about the Battle of Crete. Um, the von Blücher brothers. Um, there was also uh, another officer, Oberleutnant Alfred Gentz, uh, who survived the battle but lost two of his younger brothers on Crete as well. The paratroopers' losses were so high that Hitler told the paratroop commander Student soon afterwards that the days of such airborne operations were over. The element of surprise had been was no longer on their side and the cost of so many of these elite troops had been too high. Student's eagerness to find another stunning operation for his men had resulted in their being effectively sidelined. With Nazi Germany finding itself increasingly on the defensive as the war went on, such operations became redundant. The Fallschirmjäger would fight on as elite light infantry, often distinguishing themselves at places such as Monte Cassino or in Normandy but their days as hunters from the sky were largely over. Conversely, as the Allies moved over to the offensive, they drew different lessons and inspiration from the German paras. The British and Americans would form a large corps of airborne troops and put them to use during the invasion of Europe and into Germany. But their success would also be soured by very high casualties when things went wrong. The horrors of Crete had foreshadowed that airborne operations would remain a perilous endeavour. There the Fallschirmjäger had very nearly failed to secure the one airfield that they needed to be reinforced and relieved. Had that happened, they would have been stuck on Crete with no means of withdrawal and the entire division would have been lost, either all killed or captured. They had been very lucky to escape with an impressive yet pyrrhic victory. So I've just got the sources up there now. And whenever you want to move into questions, we can do that. Well, thank you so much for sharing your talk with us today, Craig. It was absolutely fascinating to hear more about the campaign on Creek and uh, especially to hear about it from the other side. Um, I've got some interesting questions I'd like to ask you if you don't mind. Um, sure. The first thing that comes to mind is obviously there's been some things written in recent years about the use of stimulant drugs like amphetamines with, amongst soldiers during the Second World War, sort of to you know, bolster courage, keep them awake, that kind of thing. Um, can you tell us you know, a little bit more about this and whether or not they might have been used with the German paratroopers on Crete? Thanks, yeah, good question. Um, I am aware, I, I've read a bit in recent years about the issue of um, uh, it's methamphetamine essentially which was under the brand name Pervitin uh, used by the Germans and issued widely to the Wehrmacht uh, especially in the early years of conquest of Europe and so forth um, and there's plenty of evidence that that took place yet with everything I've read all the sources I've read on the Battle of Crete I've not once seen it referred to as being used by the paratroopers on Crete. Although I would say um, such an operation, it would be highly likely that they would have used it because they um, need to, uh, these stimulants help, help one to keep awake um, um, 
and perhaps bolster courage a bit as well. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, even though I've, I've not seen it in any reliable sources referred to with the paratroops in Crete, I'd be surprised if they didn't use it. I'd be interested to, to find out a, uh, any sort of authoritative source that could confirm that though. Absolutely. I mean, it's hard to believe that you could, do, you know, be jumping out of the sky um, and not need, you know, a bit of a hand with that. So it's certainly um, an interesting point. Um, and, and on that as well, I mean, the, the Cretan people are having to defend themselves here, but there are, were accusations of sort of atrocities and war crimes after the, the campaign on Crete from the local people as well as on the part of the, the Germans. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, sure. There are um, there are accusations, allegations of um, atrocities and mistreatment um, by both sides among the the actual soldiers themselves. Um, most of that went went nowhere um, mm. after the war, but certainly, um, yes, uh, reprisals against the civilian population definitely took place. Um, the Germans were pretty outraged. As I think, as I mentioned before, they'd been misled that the Cretan civilian population would be supportive of them, and they found to their horror that not only were they not supportive of them, but that, but in some cases they took up arms against them. There were lots of allegations that Cretan civilians had um, uh, massacred um, small groups of German troops, or tortured them, or um, mutilated them, uh, dead bodies. Um, I think a lot of that was overstated, sure. um, although I'm sure there were some cases of it. Um, mm. But yeah, I think a, a lot of it was um, overstated and, and was just the, the factor of a lot of bodies lying about in extreme heat and also being got to by animals and birds and that sort of thing, which I think a lot of them mistook for mutilation by the Cretan civilians. Um, coming from Hermann Goering, the, the head of the um, Luftwaffe initially, um, reprisals were ordered and the Germans were uh, pretty ruthlessly um, instigated a, a couple of uh, reprisal massacres. In all, I think um, I think a lot of it took place in, in the weeks after the battle concluded. The battle concluded um, um, by the 1st of June right. and um, I think I've seen figures of the figures are always a bit rubbery, but certainly many, many hundreds, possibly uh, over a thousand Cretan civilians were, were executed um, by the Germans on Crete. There's also accounts, um, some of the Australians who refused to surrender, took to the hills um, and tried to escape later, and some of them were uh, helped by Cretan civilians as well, helped to hide from the Germans who were searching for them until they could try and find a way to get, get off the island. Wow. And some of the Australians said that if, they, if the Germans caught Cretans assisting Allied troops after the surrender, sometimes they would be executed for that too. Of course. Oh. Um, there was <coughs> a couple of uh, those senior generals uh, were um, brought to account with war crimes trials uh, for what happened on Crete. Um, ultimately, one, uh, the commander of the uh, first Folschemjäger regiment, Bruno Breuer, was the one who paid for it with his life. He was executed after the war, although he was probably less culpable than others. Right. Mm, who who either, either got off scot-free or um, served short, short terms in prison. Right. So it sounds certainly like a terrifying time for the Cretan people, absolutely. For sure. Um, very brave people as well, by the sounds of things. Indeed. Yeah. And just maybe to wrap up as well with, with you here, Craig, um, obviously the German paratroopers were fairly outnumbered um, when they landed on Crete. Um, so at, at times, certainly the campaign was quite close for, for either side winning it. So do you think the Allied forces should have been able to hold the island? Uh, yes, as well as the, the benefit of 2020 hindsight is always, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I suppose, yes, they should have been able to. Mm -hmm. um, they certainly had enough troops there. They did lack a lot of equipment, heavy weapons equi equipment. Mm -hmm. um, 
they were not as well organised as they would ordinarily have been. Right. They did have a good number of troops, though, 42,000. Mm. But we must remember that they had virtually no air support. Right. And they were getting absolutely hammered by the Luftwaffe. So you must take that into account. Um, the German paratroopers pressed home their attacks very, very hard. They fought very hard. Um, but, you know, the Allied troops inflicted very heavy losses on them. And I, th I think, as I, I mentioned in the presentation, it really just boiled down to that being able to hold that one airfield in the right. west at Malame and the hill which dominated at Hill 107, which is now where all the German paratroopers are buried um, on that hill, um, vast cemetery there. I think if they'd just been a little bit more organised, better appreciated that that airfield had to be held and the hill in particular had to be held. Um, if there'd been a bit of better communication between some of the New Zealand commanders there, they could have held it. Um, but, you know, they were under a lot of pressure of course. and things went wrong and the Germans seized the opportunity once they got that airfield. Um, even though it t took a lot of heavy casualties with flying those planes and you saw that image that I, I showed earlier of all those destroyed planes on that airfield, mm. um, they just pushed more and more planes in there and landed troops on the airfield rather than dropping them by uh, parachute or, or by glider so they could bring in reinforcements real quick and turn the tide of that battle quite quickly. Absolutely. Mm. Well, that, that's simply fascinating, Craig. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And um, thank you to everybody at home for tuning in as well. Um, our next webinar will be in December 2023. Um, so we hope you'll join us for that one then. Thank you very much. Goodbye.